Chair now recognizes Mr. Fry for five minutes. First, Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing today. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for being here. I'm going to highlight an example of COVID fraud in my very own district. Uh, just last year, two members of a Myrtle Beach family were sentenced in federal prison and a third to probation for their roles in a scheme to defraud the government out of more than $500,000 through a series of fake, fake tax returns and stealing stimulus checks uh, sent to other Americans under the CARES Act. While many people are struggling to make ends meet during the pandemic, these criminals went on a shopping spree with money stolen from the American people. You know, while I'm a member of Congress, I'm also a resident of that district. Uh, this is in my very own community. So I want to thank you, Chairman, for holding this, because this also touches home as it does for many Americans. Um, I would imagine, uh, Mr. Smith, that this is by no means the only place that this is happening. Can you talk about or touch on uh, similar instances that are occurring around the country from a factual standpoint? Yes, sir. Uh, while we talk somewhat about uh, transnational criminal organized groups, uh, our experience in the 5,000 plus uh, criminal, investi criminal investigations that we've opened is overwhelmingly, you know, homegrown actors. Uh, you talked about your home district, uh, Myrtle Beach. Uh, our Columbia, uh, South Carolina field office is one of our most active uh, field offices, uh, especially when it, when it comes to uh, employing task force partners. Uh, we have a uh, they actually won the cyber games that were hosted by the, the uh, National Computer Forensics Institute uh, last year. So, so we do have a lot of capacity, a lot of law enforcement passion uh, in your district. But as you mentioned uh, in your question, uh, that is a similar footprint that exists in our other cyber fraud task forces, uh, the 40, 41 other ones around the country. And, and what we do is uh, employ not just agents with guns, but analysts and, and other professionals that, that collaborate together with those financial institutions, with those local banking communities and local law enforcement professionals uh, to, uh, you know, uh, detect and arrest bad people. Thank you. And I know you touched on how you're investigating some of these actions, but can you touch on how you're identifying new cases of fraud or abuse uh, moving forward? Uh, so early in the pandemic, uh, as I mentioned in my opening, we partnered with the Department of Labor, uh, OIG, and SBA OIG, and, and we, we uh, signed MOUs, uh, memorandums, of, memorandums of, of understanding, uh, where we shared information, uh, shared anomalies, uh, shared uh, indicators of compromise that lead, lead us to uh, bad actors. Uh, I mentioned earlier how we talked to a lot of money mules. Uh, we follow money, and once you follow money and what accounts that those resources went into, uh, generally speaking, you're going to get to the bottom of a crime because uh, overwhelmingly our investigations uh, focus on folks that are looking to enrich themselves uh, through illicit activity. So once you start knocking on doors, asking questions, uh, and looking into bank accounts, uh, you're usually going to get uh, some answers from a law enforcement perspective. Thank you. Mr. Dodaro, once an improper payment uh, is, has been made, how difficult is it to recoup that money? Well, it's important to recognize that the improper payment estimates are, are estimates uh, and projected. Uh, but when they are found, it's, it's um, always difficult to recover the money. I think in, in the last two years, there have been improper payments of over $200 billion. Recoveries have been about 20, 20 23 billion. So 10, 12 percent ish? Yeah. How, how, would you agree that, I mean, in, in this instance, um, would you agree that improper payments are not always recoverable? I mean, you're just, you're going to run into a brick wall. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you're going to have the same issue with fraud. Out of all the improper payments that have been made, and I know you've collected $23 billion back, how much can we realistically re expect to recover? That, that's been about the consistent number that I've seen over time. Uh, the, the main thing I've been trying to do and, and convince Congress to have some legislation to do this uh, and oversight is to stop the improper payments in the first place. Uh, it, the same with fraud. Unless you prevent this from happening, the, the prospects of recovering this money over a period of time are pretty slim based on historical uh, evidence. And I'm going to ask this to you and the director, my final question. Is it possible from a strategy standpoint to enlist the help of states, either incentivizing it or whatever, to, to broaden that, that perspective? Is that a, a, a decent policy initiative to look into? Absolutely. 
I've been trying to convince each administration I've worked with to use the state auditors more effectively in that area. Medicaid program in particular, Medicaid program alone in the last two years has had 98 billion and 80 billion in improper payments. State auditors could help greatly. State auditors could help at, in the unemployment insurance area and auditing the federal government ought to support state auditors and they can use them to hold people more accountable for third-party deliveries. Thank you. I yield back.